Welcome to Online Worship at Adwood Presbyterian. And it's 2022, January 2nd. Who could believe it? Time sure has flown. Flown, And, um, you know, just looking at the posts my friends and, and uh, you know, other people have been putting on uh, our social media platforms, it looks like we're looking forward to a much better year than last year. And, of course, we're probably talking about the pandemic. But, uh, yeah, anyways, it's great to be here. Um, a little something a little different this week. Um, this week, remember, first off, remember we have a time change in church. We're moving to a 10 o'clock service. Um, we have a lot of reasons for doing that, and um, hopefully this will be a positive experience and to allow more people to attend worship because Sundays are busy for people. Um, the other thing is that this Sunday, I have to go up to Knox Listowel and preach their pulpit vacant. And so if you didn't know, I'm their interim moderator, which means I have to kind of make sure everything's functioning and running up there and, and basically help them find a new minister. And so uh, part of that process, you, you, you know, it's just some polity things that we got to do. We got to go up and preach the, the, the pulpit vacant. So that's going to happen this week. And it should be probably the only time I have to go up there. And uh, of course, then we have um, Doug Sargent. Uh, he's a, a member of Knox Listow. He's a lay preacher, and um, he's coming down here, and he's going to do uh, give us a message. And the interesting thing about John or Doug, sorry, I had John Chapman his bus line in my mind when I said this. But anyways, Doug Sargent used to own a bus line as well, so he has a, a lot of similarities with our congregation. And, in the, in the school buses and so anyways be sure to to welcome Doug uh, the reason I'm giving all this preamble is we don't have anyone to run the camera system and so that's why I'm putting up this short uh, video just to have something uh, for a church service this Sunday for the you know online viewers and um, it was actually um, thinking you know about this Sunday and and uh, the whole conspiracy thing has been f you know flaring up in the movies and in the media and, and, and in our lives and and uh, particular I went to, to see the last Spider-Man movie with my uh, sons and uh, there it was it was part of the subplot in one of the movies and so I'm actually repeating a sermon from um, uh, quite a while ago on conspiracy theories. So if this sounds familiar, well, it is. It's, it's a repeat. And I, I hope you uh, enjoy this message and have something to take away. And um, yeah, Jesus himself and, and the Bible were concerned about conspiracy theories. So we're going to dive into that shortly. And uh, before we read our scripture lessons, let's have a prayer for understanding for the scriptures that we're about to hear. Let's pray. O God, through your word all things came into being. In the fullness of time your word became flesh in Jesus Christ and lived among us. As we hear your written word, help us to see your truth and to testify to it that all might believe in your living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I have an Old Testament reading and um, it's from Isaiah. And uh, again, this is that conspiracy theory topic we're talking about. So pay attention to what um, Isaiah is revealing about God. This is Isaiah 8, and we're starting at verse 11, and uh, then we'll go down to probably verse 17. The Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me. I want to mention this in the Bible. Pay attention to that strong hand upon me. Warn me not to follow the way of this people. He said, Do not call conspiracy everything that these people call conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one who you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread, and he will be a sanctuary. But for both houses of Israel, he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up the testimony and seal upon the law among my disciples. 
I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. And then we turn to uh, Revelations. And uh, so we're kind of in the middle of Revelations, um, Revelations 13. And um, yeah, this is uh, again um, historical fact. And uh, Revelations is kind of hard for people to read because it's in uh, it's it's a type of um, literature called apocalyptic literature, and so it's got all these these images and this imagery that seems wild to your imagination. But within that, there is a message that people of that time would have understood. And um, and in this particular one, there is a conspiracy theory hidden in here. So let's read um, Revelation 13. We'll start at verse 11 and we'll go down to maybe verse 15. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and his inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he had given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it would speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Amen. Now I actually read a little bit more there than I was intending to. Um, it's the mark of the beast and um, again this is something that creates a lot of concern about people and is misrepresented uh, but in that time there was this emperor cult and so the emperor was viewed as a god a small g god though not and so they uh, you had to go worship him and uh, when you went to worship, you were given a, a little note or a mark that said that you had been to worship, that you had did your duty, and that you were a, a good um, citizen of the area, and you had to have that mark in order to do business anywhere. So it was kind of forcing someone to do something against their will. And so um, we aren't diving into that, but just kind of a neat aside uh, for the scripture. So anyways, getting to our sermon. I read an article a while ago that made the point that Christians should pay attention to what people are talking about in the media. What is being written in the newspapers and books? What are people singing about? And what is in the movies? The reason to pay attention to these things and what is being talked about is the content. The content is that is engaging people. And through paying attention to the content, is revealed what people are concerned about, what are they are trying to understand as they travel through this modern society of ours. As Christians, how do we make sense of what is happening? And more importantly, how do we respond as Christians? Last week, my sons dragged me to see the new Spider-Man movie. It's in the Listowel Theater. Well, I really enjoy adventure movies, so maybe they didn't really drag me. Maybe I kind of went on my own free will. But what fascinated me at watching this movie was one of the subplots. The subplot was dealing with conspiracy theories. It had a reporter. He was taking the information, misrepresenting it to the public, and in doing so, he was creating a lot of damage to people. He was damaging their reputations. He was damaging their livelihoods. He was creating anxiety with these people, like, I haven't done anything wrong. It created a lot of chaos and the reporter seemed to be blind to what was happening around him. Now, as I was saying, I've been curious about the proliferation of conspiracy theories, the spreading of falsehoods and outright lies, 
and the fact that people believe these things. They're in the news daily. The World Health Organization has actually declared the spread of this type of misinformation an infodemic. Oh, isn't that kind of a neat word, an infodemic? The spread of incorrect information. And right now is particularly about the COVID virus, but there's other things. And all these things pose risks to global health, or mental health, or stability. Conspiracy theories. Do you believe them or not? I would suggest that each one of us has fallen victim at some point or another. Many of them are humorous, or we dismiss as humorous, pure entertainment. Oh, come on. Who hasn't speculated about whether Elvis is alive living in a retirement community in Florida? We have fun with it. But the reality is, who cares about that conspiracy? It doesn't really affect me or my life. But other conspiracies that we've seen in the last few months, last few years, are extremely dangerous and inspire acts of violence as well as antisocial behavior. It seems to be tearing at the very fabric of society. Every day in the news, there is a mention of the latest conspiracy, the latest lie, or, you know, kind of stretching of the truth, or twisting of the truth to, to manipulate people. It feels like there's a conspiracy theory behind every door we look at. And as I look to the Bible for insight, when I started researching this topic for this sermon, I was surprised that the Bible has lots to say about conspiracy. Conspiracies have been with us from the beginning of time. Genesis, God tells Adam and Eve not to eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or they will die. But the devious serpent plants a seed of conspiracy in their mind. Oh, God told you this because he is afraid you will become like God. You will not die. Well, there is a bit of a truth in this statement. They will not die a physical death, but they did die spiritually. Their relationship with God was broken. And we know what the rest of the story is. A few things to think about. First, conspiracies can be true. In fact, there is a kernel of truth or possibility behind all these theories. Perhaps this is the reason why so many people believe in these theories. But there is some psychology involved in understanding the why do people believe. They need to feel like they're in control in a situation in which they have no control. We need a, a sense of control over events. The conspiracies provide us with an explanation of those events over which we cannot exert control given the national feeling of suspicion towards government at this time, it becomes understandable that there would be a tendency to believe that the government is up to no good. What drives me personally crazy about government conspiracy theories is that people tend to have these theories that require the government to be one-minded, single-minded, perfectly efficient, to have thousands of people keep a secret. Well, personally having worked in a government position, you soon discover that those points are impossibilities. As Christians, we need to be wary of conspiracy theories. The Bible makes this point. And you know, it points at that warning to us in Exodus 20, 16. One of the Ten Commandments about bearing false witness. It's the Eighth Commandment from God. And Paul warns us in Ephesians 4, 4 15, we are to be driven by fear or anger, but by a desire to speak the truth in love. One group that needs to be concerned about is the QAnon conspiracy movement. And the reason I'm raising this group is they've started a new church that started with the started and it integrates the conspiracy theories and its religious practices and its doctrines. The QAnon conspiracy theory just originated in 2017 on an internet message board with a user identified as Q claiming he had insider information in the administration of the United States President Donald Trump. 
and through a series of anonymous posts, Q propagated the conspiracy that Trump was battling against the child trafficking ring that included deep state government officials, prominent Democrats, and members of Hollywood. You may remember the story of a pizzeria. The conspiracy was that they were holding children captive in its basement. A person, a devout Christian, so believed the story, he went to the pizzeria to free the captives. He was armed with a rifle and discovered that there was no basement, there was no prisoners. The conspiracy was false, he had been misled, and he was arrested. What concerns us as Christians is QAnon's most troubling aspect is its use of the language and the style of Christianity. It mis misuses Bible scripture, disguise its deception, and as one author writes, says a syncretic cult, a semi-Christian heresy. Syncretic cult, a semi-Christian heresy. Just say that one five times fast. That's a mouthful. But basically it means QAnon plays on a person's emotions and undermines the authority of scripture and the trust we owe only to Christ. Christians have a responsibility to learn to identify it. The truth is political intrigue. Conspiracy theories absolutely exist in Jesus' time. From the time of the Herods to the Romans, Jesus and his disciples and later the first century church were surrounded by secret plots with the government and society. But notice Jesus did not arm his disciples with knowledge and facts about the secret dealings of the Jewish religious leaders and the Romans. He simply taught them to love and care for one another. In Luke 6.27, Jesus teaches to love your enemy, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistrust you. Scripture plays a large part in conspiracy theories and the QAnon movement. Many web posts make frequent, oblique, and semi-hidden, although sometimes explicit, reference to the end days scenario that we find in the book of Revelations. Now, we're never going to talk, make a full discussion of the purpose of the book of Revelations, but know it is written for a specific people at a specific time with a specific problem. It's not about future events. The people of the time are living a subsistence lifestyle and they were concerned about just surviving for tomorrow, not worried about some possible apocalypse of the future. The neat thing is that its author John wrote revelations in such a way that we could find answers in our current time. Revelation can also be interpreted as making a point about any evil and oppressive government that seeks to usurp the lordship of God and his holiness. The book was written to seven churches to address a crisis of faith in their communities. Some of the Christians were compromising their faith by entering into adulterous practices of the secular world, especially as it pertained to emperor worship. Remember that little bit of scripture I read? The emperor is viewed as a living God and needed to be worshipped. The book of Revelation written by John of Padmos calls the Christians of that day back to the worship of God and Christ and not to participate in adulterous worship. The book also warns these Christians in Asia that they will soon face a period of unprecedented persecution and encourages them to focus on and follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Book of Revelation is very intimidating to read and puzzling if it's not explained well. It is filled with disturbing imagery and it often leaves many of us readers shaking our heads with confusion. For this reason, you can see why it's so easy to use the scripture in an abusive way. One warning John the Padmos makes in Revelation 13 is telling the churches about a conspiracy theory to be aware of concerned about. Revelation 13 3 John makes reference to a Caesar by the name of Nero. He writes the beast seemed to have a fatal flaw and had been healed. Well this is reference to a well-known conspiracy theory of the time. It was called the Nero Redivius conspiracy theory. The idea was that Nero had attempted to die 
had attempted to die by suicide with a sword, but had survived, been healed, and was in hiding, waiting to reclaim his power. Of course, the truth of this conspiracy is he was dead. But the theory persisted, despite a lack of... <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry about that. Of course, the truth of this conspiracy is he had he was dead. The theory persisted, despite a lack of evidence, until the end of the century, and even beyond that. John was warning that a false conspiracy theory, one based on no evidence, evidence could be very dangerous. We need to keep our focus on Jesus. Then we have Isaiah. Isaiah warns us not to replace God with competing conspiracies. That was verse 13. Faith needs to remain our steering wheel in life. And if we're not thinking, discerning, we can be susceptible to views that replace God. God is the only one who is truly holy, which is a comfort in our uncertain, often un, you know, fearful world. There are many competing philosophies in our world and many dangerous ideas. Think of the people who have influenced you the most. They could be authors, teachers, friends, and are they trusted people of faith? Go back to Texas. It says, listen, this is how the Lord spoke to me with a strong hand upon me. This message is coming from the mouth of Isaiah the prophet, but with the authority of the Lord. Often the phrase, a strong hand upon me, indicates an overpowering experience of divine revelation and showed, and the prophets knew God was with them and in control of their lives. So now we have this message coming from our loving God, a God who keeps his promises, a God who has authority, and a God who act, is actively involved in our lives. It's important to hear the message again. The seeds of fear, doubt, anger, confusion have been sown by human mouths. These seeds have sprouted confusion, misinformation, suspicion, mistrust, civil tension. The conspiracy theories enter the social interactions of Christians. We need to stand firm and point to where the truth actually lies. The true good news found in the gospel message. Oh man. Well, there was a message uh, on conspiracy theories for you, and I hope you had something there to, to nourish your soul, something to think about, something to ponder this week as we interact with the world and, and, and push back against the lies so that deceive us and deceive people that uh, prevent us from seeing Jesus at work in this world. Well, we enter the end of a, another worship service, and uh, I hope uh, you're going to have a wonderful new year, and uh, go with the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. God bless.